ahead and get started. So thank you guys for having me. I was just chatting with Dr. Comer, and I want to just publicly congratulate him and his team, Sarah Lynn. This is a, a tremendous endeavor that you guys have put together. When, uh, when my department saw what you guys were doing, I had the same reaction everybody else did, which was to first say, this is absolutely genius, and second say, why didn't I think of it first? So I congratulate you guys. This is uh, just such a great thing that you're doing. I've actually sat in and listened to a bunch of the lectures myself in the background when I've been here in the office. So I want to really publicly say thanks for doing this. Uh, so my name is Shahom Roy. I'm the vice chair of the ENT department at the University of Texas at Houston. I'm the chief of pediatric otolaryngology here. And I'm also the director of quality and safety. I hold some roles quality and safety nationally that I'll talk about a little bit uh, when I go forward. Um, like all things in my career, I typically tend to forget that I've agreed to do things until about the day before they happen. And this is me last night suddenly saying, I'd better pull out a quality and safety talk and put something together, uh, much like Thomas Jefferson on July 3rd. A little bit of background about me. So actually, I was in practice at the University of Miami after I finished my fellowship training in Pittsburgh. I had done my residency down at University of Miami, great place to be, and I went back as faculty uh, after I finished my fellowship. This is the view from my apartment in Miami. I was in practice at the University of Miami for about eight years, and I got a call from the University of Texas saying, you got to come down to Houston. You got to come take a look at this place. It's a great job. It's a great place to be a single guy. I promise we'll even upgrade your view. This is my new view in Texas. I will tell you that it is not quite the same as living in Miami, but I do have a great job here. It turns out if you wait around Houston long enough, you can still get your water view back. This was my front yard during Hurricane Harvey two years ago. Uh, I was giving a talk uh, in Texas not too long ago, and I remember thinking, is it too soon to make Hurricane Harvey jokes? Turns out, yes, it is too soon to make Hurricane Harvey jokes in Texas. Um, this is my division of pediatric laryngology. We've got a full faculty here at UT of about 20 old laryngologists. We've got my partner, Sanjak Jane Ziang, and then me as the division chief, just add a little flavor to the department. And if any of you residents watching or watching this recorded version are looking for a position in pediatric otolaryngology, certainly we are expanding our division at some point in the near future. Give me a call if that becomes something of interest to you. Um, I have no financial disclosures related to this talk. For the residents, you know, as you go forward, you will be asked about your financial disclosures. Make sure you read these things very carefully. I was giving a talk in Ohio, <coughs> in Ohio excuse me, not all that long ago. And I was asked, um, I don't know if you can see my arrow here, I was asked to list my disclosures. I would like to point out that at the time I was giving these disclosures, I was actually a consultant for Alcon Labs, the makers of Cipridex that we're all very familiar with. I was not, as they listed me, a consultant for Acon Labs, the writer of Smack That. So you want to be careful about how they actually list your disclosures going forward. So why do we talk about quality? Well, you guys know, and I'm not going to get into a bunch of stuff about coronavirus right now, but we know that right now we're on an unsustainable path. Our national deficit has gone up dramatically over the past few decades, and we're holding increasing amount of debts over time. This was projected for 2020 data. We've actually almost doubled that for 2020 just because of all of our current healthcare climate issues. At the same time, we spend a ridiculous amount of money on healthcare. And in fact, when you look at it in 2016, we spent close to $2 trillion on healthcare. Okay, we have one of the most advanced healthcare systems on the planet, so you would expect us to spend the most on healthcare, more so than most other nations, right? Except we're actually spending more and increasing our spending for healthcare more than most other countries are doing. So you can see that we've had a 17% rise in our healthcare spending compared to 11% average healthcare spending increases for other nations similar to ours. So we're actually increasing our ramp up of spending for healthcare more so than countries in parallel. Well, okay, again, we've got one of the most advanced healthcare systems in the world, so you might expect that we're gonna increase our spending faster than others are. The problem with that idea is, we're not getting better care as a result of it. And in fact, when you look at causes of death, our mortalities are higher in this country compared to 
other parallel or other uh, analogous countries. So you can see that we actually have more deaths from cardiac disease, similar in cancers, more respiratory diseases, more external, and those are things like homicides and traffic accidents. We have more and more death related to healthcare conditions than other countries that are spending less money than we are. So they're spending less, but they're still getting better outcomes. So that's why we have these major issues because we're spending more and more and healthcare is gonna be a big part of our federal spending. When you look at our spending as a percentage of GDP, it was projected that major healthcare or major health programs are gonna represent about 10% of our federal spending. That number, and this slide is clearly out of date, that number now is expected to be closer to 11% by 2030. So we're spending more and more of our GDP on healthcare than we are on any other social programs in this country, and we're still not getting better outcomes as a result. Whoops. Okay, let's see here. So, why is that relevant for quality? Well, first of all, there is incredible variation across this country in how we deliver care and what the quality of our care is that we actually delivered. And it's clearly, as you can see from those previous slides, not explained by the amount of money that we're spending, right? Quality is something that we are constantly changing and we are constantly reevaluating. And now there's increasing scrutiny around how we deliver healthcare, and I'm going to get into some examples of that, how patients experience their healthcare, and on our public reporting of these things. Now, right now, most people aren't actually relying on quality data to make these decisions, but going forward, I'm going to show you a few examples that quality data is actually going to become an increasing part both of how consumers and patients make their decisions and also how we get reimbursed and how we do our jobs. Now, I do a fair amount of public speaking every year. Once or twice a year, I'm asked to do one of these sorts of video chats. This is always strange for me because I like interaction. So there's a chat box. I encourage you to use it, please, please, please. Otherwise, I have no idea if my jokes are funny. So at least interact with me, engage with me a little, or turn your videos on for the attendees so I know that you're uh, getting something out of this. Okay, so we're going to talk about two different things today. We're going to talk about quality first, and then we're going to talk about safety. The quality is going to be a mishmash of bizarre governmental CMS slides with a lot of data on them. I'm going to try to break them down into ways that actually make sense. Then we're going to get a little bit into safety, and I want to get into some examples of how you guys can actually get involved in the quality and safety arena. I'm on the uh, AAO uh, PSQI, the Patient Safety and Quality Improvement Committee. I have some leadership within the AAO for uh, Patient Safety and Quality Improvement. Quality improvement is a part of your educational curriculum, and now it is mandatory that you have to have some involvement or training, formalized training in safety and quality improvement, and I want to show you how that can actually be meaningful for you rather than just as a requirement of something you have to do, but instead something that you're actually interested in doing. So, you can't talk about quality until you know what quality is. And quality in healthcare actually has distinctive components that you need to know. And this is probably the single most important thing I'm gonna say is how do you define quality? Quality is in many people's eyes similar to the old Supreme Court definition of pornography. You can't really define it, but you know it when you see it, right? Except that in healthcare, we can actually define quality because there are six parameters around quality care. And these are the parameters that you really need to understand. Okay, so quality care is care that is most importantly, whoops, sorry, let me make sure I've got this going here. It's safe, all right? So quality and safety go hand in hand. Providing safe care is a critical part of delivering quality health care. At the same time, it's got to be effective. It's not only safe, but it has to work because otherwise, how is that delivering quality care if it's not actually making a difference? It needs to be delivered efficiently meaning that we need to do it at the best value of cost that we can, and it needs to be delivered fairly across the population. If we're only delivering these quality care metrics to certain parts of the population, then we're not really delivering quality care. It should be delivered fairly across all different, uh, all different uh, populations. It needs to be patient-centered. We need to be focusing on what our patients actually need and what they want out of their healthcare. So we wanna ask, what is it that you hope to get out of your healthcare? And how can we deliver those as well? Because our focus needs to be around the patient experience and the patient outcome, 
rather than on our giving end of the, the healthcare issue. And finally, delivered in a timely manner because no, no delivery of care can really be considered a very high quality if it's not given to you in a meaningful time frame. So these are the six parameters of quality in healthcare. They gotta be safe, effective, efficient, delivered fairly in a patient-centered manner and in a timely manner, okay? So this, in my summary, this isn't the IOM summary, my summary is it's the right care delivered in the right way, meaning safely, at the right time to the right people and maintaining good outcomes. That's quality care. Seems easy enough, right? How do we not, uh, I'm sure we can get that easily. So the Institute of Medicine is the first group that actually came up with these six parameters. And they said that you wanna increase the likelihood of desired health outcomes that are consistent with our current professional knowledge. So these six elements go into the delivery of quality care. So why does that matter to us specifically? We're surgical subspecialists. You think of quality care through these uh, accountable care organizations and primary care and pr uh, patient-centered medical homes and these primary care delivery networks. It actually really matters to, quality, to otolaryngologists. And in fact, otolaryngologists have always been on the forefront of quality and safety because we're specialty surgeons who do very high-risk surgery sometimes. Well, most of all, quality and safety should matter to you because it's the morally right thing to do. We all became physicians because we wanted to deliver care to people, and of course we want to deliver it in a safe and quality manner. Patient safety is going to save your butts, and you're going to see how it saved mine uh, going forward, because if you do safe care for patients, it's going to protect your career. Unfortunately, because we are all reliant on a very complex healthcare system, your ability to make a living is now going to become dependent on quality care, and I'll get into the details of that in just a little bit. Unfortunately, we've all kind of been put on the defensive around quality and safety because it's no longer that we are taking the initiative to provide quality care. Now we're backpedaling on our heels to make sure we're keeping up with quality metrics. And at the same time, it's because patients aren't just patients anymore now, right? People refer to patients as consumers and clients instead of patients. The paternalistic model is gone. We believe now in this shared decision-making process where patients actually are the consumers of healthcare and have a say like any other consumer business in what the outcome actually should be. And if you don't believe it, just go to Google, right? Patients are now empowered. They want transparency. They want accountability because they wanna make their decisions around people who have quality metrics. So if you Google your own name, you're gonna find all kinds of ratings about you, some of which may not even be accurate and you have no recourse. This is what happens when people are empowered to make decisions. So as part of delivering quality care, we have to understand that the patient's input into this is a big part of it. By the way, if you ever get a chance, right over here, go to my Yelp review sometime. It, this appeared out of nowhere. It's one of the funniest things I've ever read in my life, especially when you can say pediatric otolaryngologists came practically moonwalking into the room. That review tracks me up to this day. For any of you who are Simpsons fans, uh, one of my favorite lines from The Simpsons, when, he, when Marge says, from what I hear, you waltz into work at 10.30, take a nap on the toilet, and then sit around Googling your own name until lunch. Um, and so I don't sit around Googling my own name all the time, but it is something to, uh, to do so that you can see where you're being rated by these patients. Now, here's where we get into all the nuts and bolts and sort of the difficult stuff. And I don't want to belabor all these very complex slides that I have. But I do want to just give you a little bit of an overview of the timeline around quality measurement. So quality measurement actually goes way back to the 80s when the presidential commission started reporting on healthcare quality. And then about 10 years later, we established the National Quality Forum. And at the same time, the Institute of Medicine report came out, and you're all familiar with the Institute of Medicine report. That's the one that said to err is human and suggested that six figures worth of patients were being killed by medical errors every year. And that's the study that everybody always cites as saying that we fail to deliver quality health care. Even though that study is considered now to be relatively flawed, it's always used as the benchmark. People always cite the IOM study from 20 years ago saying that we're killing patients because we're not providing uh, good uh, health care. And after that, we started improving our quality. So you'll notice there was about a 10 year gap while the commission started putting things together. And then it wasn't until almost 2000 that we started developing all of these quality programs 
So I'm having my Marco Rubio moment here, um, where we have the Hospital Quality Alliance and the Ambulatory Quality Care Alliance and things like that started developing in the early 2000s. But here's where it really gets interesting. Now, in the mid-2000s, here's where Medicare starts actually delivering payment for reporting performance measures. They provided a 2% incentive payment to hospitals for reporting quality metrics in 2006. Then we started posting mortality rating, rating, and then along with the Affordable Care Act, started coming in measurements of physician reporting. And so those are things like PQRS, the Physician Quality Reporting System. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes here. And then more recently in the 2010s, we started talking about value-based purchasing and accountable care organizations, and those rules started coming out. And then, of course, it resulted in our EHR meaningful use reporting. You guys are all familiar with meaningful use, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes as well. Okay, so CMS is ultimately the people who decide about how these quality initiatives are integrated into our healthcare system. These are not independent grassroots organizations going from the bottom up saying, for example, in Kentucky, that the Kentucky Medical Organization says we're going to have a quality care initiative that then is going to find its way to the federal government. No, these things come from the top down. They come from CMS, and then they work their way down. And CMS are the ones who invented PQRS. They're the ones who invented the meaningful use and the electronic prescribing incentive program and created these programs to incentivize us to provide quality care and more importantly, to report our metrics around quality care and to be transparent about it. So these all come from the top down. And as you can see, when they started doing these things, like all good crack dealers, they start by giving you the first one for free and incentivizing you to do it. So take a look at this chart over time. When PQRS was initially implemented, you would actually get an incentive if you reported your quality metrics in PQRS. So as a physician in practice, if you reported your quality metrics in PQRS or as a system, so my university, for example, uh, released its PQRS data, you'd get an incentive for a couple of years. And then if you failed to do it, you'd start getting penalized. So they incentivize you to do it to kind of get you on the hook and then penalize you if you don't do it. So the people who skipped out on these first few years suddenly found themselves facing penalties. Same thing was true for meaningful use. When you started doing meaningful use of your electronic medical record, where you actually had to engage patients through a portal, you had to have a certain number of uh, metrics on your EHR that you were assessing, you would actually get paid more for doing so, and you could receive a relatively sizable bonus from CMS to get paid to use these metrics. But unfortunately, then as time went on, now you started having a penalty for not doing meaningful use. So started as a reward, then becomes a penalty. E-prescribing, right off the bat, they said you gotta do this because this is a lot safer and more efficient and allows for timely care delivery. So there was a penalty off the bat if you didn't do e-prescribing and it just gets worse as time goes on. And that's kind of the flow you're gonna see. All these quality metrics, you may get paid more at first, but you're gonna start getting penalized if you don't play along with this thing. Along with this comes the increasing public scrutiny of how we're delivering our healthcare, right? And the headlines are always really gruesome about that. How do we stop hospitals from killing us? Why do we have dangerous doctors? I'm sure you've all read about Dr. Death, the neurosurgeon up at Dallas, lack of physician accountability, right? So all of these things are actually getting more scrutiny from the public. Now, otolaryngology was kind of left out of the fray. A lot of the initial reporting around this was in primary care. Um, it was kind of it, it was kind of almost a bizarre little slip when otolaryngology got involved, and it was when President Obama, who I have an immense amount of respect for, and I don't want to talk politics here, but I just I don't want to offend anybody when I say this. I have an immense amount of respect for President Obama and his administration and the way they handled a lot of things, but he happened to just kind of off the cuff his speechwriter mentioned something that hit very hard to otolaryngologists. When he was talking about the ACA, he happened to mention, hey, the doctor may look at the reimbursement system and say to himself, you know what, I make a lot more money if I take this kid's tonsils out. Now, that may be the right thing to do, but I'd rather have that doctor making those decisions based on whether you really need your kid's tonsils out or whether it might make more sense just to change. Maybe they have allergies. Maybe they have something else that would make a difference. 
oh, President Obama, we have an episode of way overusing cardiac stents in patients and stenting peripheral vascular disease. Why couldn't you have gone after cardiovascular stenting instead? He just happened to mention tonsillectomy. Okay, so be it. So the AAO comes up with a response that they released the next day. And they said, we too are in favor of evidence-based medicine that supports quality patient care. President Obama's statement highlights the complexity of medical decisions like this. However, the AAO is disappointed by the president's portrayal of the decision-making processes by the physicians who perform these surgeries. In many cases, tonsillectomy may be a more effective treatment and less costly than prolonged or repeated treatments for an infected throat. Here in the state of Texas, we're reimbursed about $90 by state payers for doing a tonsillectomy, including the risks associated with post-op care. So the AAO responded rather firmly and rather quickly. I'm pretty convinced this is the AAO's equivalent of doing something like this. This was their response. So unfortunately, after that, what started happening? Sure enough, people started paying attention to tonsillectomy. Tonsillectomy became the next thing people were talking about in avoidable care, right? We were doing too many tonsillectomies. It's a silent epidemic of unnecessary care, said David Goodman, who's very, very famous um, in uh, healthcare quality delivery, and called it a silent epidemic of unnecessary care. And then right on the heels of this, what happened? This case. And many of you, gosh, it's 2020, so I guess all the residents were not residents when this case went on. You were probably in medical school or some of you were an undergraduate. Um, this was a terrible case that happened out in Oakland, California, where a young lady with some comorbidities had a tonsillectomy, unfortunately bled significantly and ended up having a massive hypoxic brain injury. She was declared dead by the state, but the family refused to accept that definition of death. They sued the state and eventually won the right to leave her on life support and moved her to a facility in New Jersey after about a year of legal wrangling. But it made the headlines and it was really awful and it brought tonsillectomy into a very bad light. Um, articles all over the news about this because now suddenly people were saying, well, should we be treating sleep apnea with tonsillectomy if it's causing brain death? Is there really a need for these tonsillectomies at all? So that was a big part of how we got dragged into this first concept of healthcare quality delivery in otolaryngology and why it's so important that we understand how we're delivering healthcare. And now, along with that, we got to start thinking about patient-centered care because the IOM says that the patient experience should be a huge source of the definition of quality. Now, I could go on and on about the things I both agree with and disagree with around this, because I feel like a lot of times if you over empower patients or let them kind of call the shots, terrible things can happen. The uh, opioid epidemic to me is a big part of that. If you're just trying to keep people happy, write them opioids when they request them, that's not necessarily the right thing to do. Writing antibiotics unnecessarily is not the right thing to do. But we do want to pay attention to the experience that the patient has. So uh, let's see. Sorry, I'm trying to juggle like three video screens at once here. Okay, so patient experience goes into your quality composite score. Now, how do we assess patient experience, folks? These are the things like HCAPs and Prescani. So when we talk about Prescani and HCAPs and you look at those scores and like, uh, like me, many of you take your HCAP scores, you kind of give it a glance and you toss it off. Well, guess what? That number actually goes into your quality of care composite score, which helps determine how much you're gonna get reimbursed around the care. So how your patient perceives their experience with you actually makes a huge difference in how you're gonna get reimbursed and how you're gonna get paid. There are a few tricks that I wanna teach you about patient satisfaction with the experience. Okay, this is a paper from a good friend of mine, but here's one of the most fascinating things about it. One of the easiest ways to double your patient satisfaction is to make sure they know your name. You would be amazed at the number of times physicians will go or physicians will see a patient and the patient walks away from the encounter and a week later when somebody else asks who they saw, they have no idea what your name was. Make sure they know your name. That's the easiest way to improve your satisfaction of patient experience. At the same time, if you can do something about it, parking is the biggest detriment to the patient experience. No matter how great your office was, if they have a terrible experience with parking, your patient satisfaction goes way down. 
So my building, for example, across the street where my clinic is, is 27, 30, 31 stories high. We're on the 27th floor. You either pay to park for $10 or you pay the valet $15 and there's no parking anywhere else on the Texas Medical Center campus that's anywhere nearby. The patients hate the parking experience here and it's always gonna hurt our patient satisfaction scores. If you can provide good parking, you're gonna improve patient satisfaction. Make sure they know your name. My third trick is the simplest one of all, which is the bottom one, your visit time. The more time that patients perceive you spend with you, the more satisfaction they get out of their visit. Now, you're going to have a limited amount of time. As a pediatric laryngologist, I don't have any um, advanced practice providers in my practice, but I typically schedule about 20 patients per half-day clinic, scheduled between 8.30 and 11 a.m. So in two and a half hours, I'm going to try to see 20 patients expecting to be done by uh, 12. How do you do that and make the patients feel like you spent a lot of time with them? One simple trick, sit down. Every patient that you see, please sit in a chair when you speak with them. Do not stand up during the course of the visit. Patients, when they see you sitting down, there was a great study about this. I didn't put the data in, but they actually perceived that your visit lasted much longer than it actually did because you sat down. The same time frame, if you're standing up, they perceive the visit as being much shorter. So the simple act of sitting down on a rolling chair or in a stool or whatever while you're talking to the patient makes all the difference in improving your visit time experience. So those are three tricks you can use to improve your patient satisfaction tricks, okay? Now, we also are measuring quality care around the effectiveness of your care, as we've talked about. Now, how do we measure effectiveness? Well, AHRQ, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, is looking at effectiveness based on specific measures of specific disease processes. Now, in otolaryngology, we don't have a ton of those that we're evaluating right now, but I want to go over at least a couple of them with you. So one of them is otitis media with effusion. They are checking to make sure that you had a hearing test performed, for patients who got tubes um, because they had otitis media with effusion. That's considered one of the things to make sure that you're delivering effective clinical care. At the same time, we also want to make sure that we're not doing CT scans overly for patients with routine acute sinusitis. So in other words, if you have routine acute sinusitis and you ordered a CT scan, that qualifies as overuse. That's not reducing cost, that's increasing cost and decreasing efficiency. So they're always gonna be checking to see if you ordered a CT scan for uncomplicated acute sinusitis that could have been treated first. If these sound familiar to you, it's because these are also the same topics around which we have clinical practice guidelines. These clinical practice guidelines are helping us understand what we should really be doing for best practices. And in turn, those measurements are being utilized by CMS to make sure that we're following best practices to ensure that we're delivering quality care, all right? So it's really important. One of the tips I tell my residents here, when you see clinical practice guideline from one of our major journals, that is an article worth reading every time. Every time that's an article worth at least reading the talking points to know that you're doing things the right way because governmental payers are picking up on this as best practice and commercial insurers are going to do the same. So your reimbursement is going to be tied to following clinical practice guidelines, especially the strong recommendations around them. So when you look at the actual quality metrics around them, there are actually only a handful of PQRS measures that are specific to otolaryngology and otolaryngologic disease processes, many of which are actually being assessed at the primary care level. So the big ones are things like otitis externa. They are checking to make sure that for uncomplicated otitis externa in a non-immunocompromised patient, that systemic antibiotics were not given, that's considered a penalty, but that topical therapy was given, which is considered a reward. So that means you're following following the clinically accepted best practices, and that's how your quality is being measured around that. So look at those clinical practice guidelines and make sure that you're following these clinical recommendations based on evidence, because those are the things that are being assessed at the same time. Okay, if these all sound familiar to you, the Academy has been really good about taking these clinical practice guidelines and turning them into talking points. You may have heard of the Choosing Wisely campaign. The Choosing Wisely campaign, in summary, 
a lot of different organizations. It came out of the American Board of Internal Medicine. They went to all of these parent organizations and said, give us the five things that drive you nuts. List for us the five things that you think clinicians are doing wrong and that patients need to know to try to improve quality of their care. So these are the old laryngology five things. You can imagine, for example, in pediatrics, the Choosing Wisely campaign, number one on their list was don't prescribe antibiotics for a presumed viral infection, right? Because people overuse antibiotics for upper respiratory infections in children. For us in otolaryngology, we don't get a CT right off the bat for sudden hearing loss. Don't prescribe oral antibiotics for tympanostomy tubes. Don't prescribe oral antibiotics for otitis externa. Don't get CTs for uncomplicated sinusitis. Don't get imaging for patients who have primary hoarseness until you've looked at the larynx and have a reason to get it. So these are the quality metrics that are also being utilized by CMS. So these kind of all come together, our clinical practice guidelines, our academy recommendations, and what CMS is using to track our improvement, okay? But can we actually measure meaningful outcomes? That's a little bit more difficult to do from a surgical perspective when you're in otolaryngology because otolaryngology in general is a pretty safe thing to do. Now, NISQIP through the American College of Surgeons, that's National Surgical Quality Improvement Program, is now tracking surgical outcomes. But they're looking at the big outcome problems that you might anticipate. So these are things like hospital-acquired infections, pneumonias, UTIs, cardiac arrest, unexpected reintubations, CLABSIs. These are all major outcomes in NISQIP that your institution is going to be looking for. Thankfully, in otolaryngology, most of these don't apply to us because 90% of the operations we do are outpatient surgeries. Um, actually, I'm sorry, 75% of the uh, surgeries we do are outpatient, 90% of them are elective, and only a handful of our cases are really sick patients who have cardiac comorbidities, chronic lung disease, and nutritional requirements. So a lot of these sort of serious adverse outcomes that are being tracked by NISQIP don't really fall under our purview. Um, so that makes it harder. So you ask yourself, where do we focus otolaryngology quality initiatives? Well, there is actually very little that we do in otolaryngology that contributes a lot to mortality. The biggest things that really become a problem, and this came from Emily Boss and Rahul Shah, who did a tremendous paper on looking at quality outcome metrics in pediatric otolaryngology, where we have room for standardization is around tracheostomy and around airway reconstruction a little bit less in some of the ear surgery. But there's almost no standardization that we need to do for peritonsillar abscess because it's relatively standardized anyway. So when you look at where we should be focusing otolaryngology quality efforts, there are a few things that stand out. Tracheostomy is certainly one of them. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Now, how does this tie into reimbursement? Well, you may have heard the terms MIPS and MACRA, and I want to go through what that actually means for you. How am I doing on time? All right, uh, I got a long ways to go, so I got to pick up the pace here, and I know I already talked fast. So MACRA is the Medicare Access and Chip Reauthorization Act. What it essentially says is that we're going to be setting terms around how you get reimbursed. Now, this was an improvement over what it used to be, which was called the SGR. If you're familiar with the SGR, the SGR was the sustainable growth rate. And the SGR came out of the Balance Budget Act in uh, the late 90s. And SGR basically said that every year we were going to have a fixed amount of increase in the payments that could be made through CMS payers. And every year when the SGR was set to expire, there was all this big hoopla and everybody would rush to Washington to say, we can't let the SGR expire. We got to renew it. We would lobby for it. It would get renewed. This went on year after year after year. So every year there was this override from Congress called the doc fix, the annual doc fix. And eventually with the ACA, we said, okay, this is not sustainable. This, this uh, sustainable growth rate actually isn't sustainable a long time. We've got to find a better way to do this. So with that came MACRA, which was essentially the permanent doc fix from Congress. So MACRA said that we were going to go ahead and set the terms around how we qualify reimbursement in a manner that is non-punitive, but actually make sure that we can uh, sustain growth over time. We got unanimous support in organized medicine, we got by, by housel congressional support, and everybody was kind of celebrating about it. And the idea was we would submit our performances, get some feedback, and then get an adjustment in our pay around how we did with our terms that we sent in. So that was kind of the, the idea was that in 2017, we'd start measuring our performance, 
then we would submit our data, we'd get some feedback, and then we'd see a cost or a payment adjustment around how that worked. And the idea was that it was a net neutral. You could either go up in percentage or you could go down depending on how you were performing. So there were going to be winners and losers. And with MACRA, there would be up to a 10% eventually by 2025 adjustment in payments, either up or down, depending on how your performance impact, uh, your performance metrics were improving or not. And with that came the merit-based incentive payment system. That's MIPS. So you hear this in the same term because this is how payment is determined within MACRA. So MIPS applies to all of us as physicians. It applies to all the advanced practitioners and CRNAs and things like that. And MIPS basically says that you're going to get paid based around those evidence-based quality metrics that I talked about earlier. So those quality metrics are going to determine how your adjustment gets paid. Now, there are a bunch of different components to MIPS, okay? Quality is the one that we've talked about. So the PQRS, Physician Quality Reporting System, has now been replaced. So we're now using all these other quality metrics instead of straight PQRS. Improvement activities is a new category. This is where the government asks you to report that you are doing activities internally to improve your quality performance. And you have to show proof that you're taking on some kind of an endeavor to improve your quality. I'll show you an example of that in a little bit. Um, advancing care information. So that replaced the meaningful use from the EHR. This is now the advancing care, which says, are patients actually using a portal um, to communicate with you, for example? That's one way that you're getting paid. Are you electronic prescribing more than 90% of your prescriptions? If so, that's one of the ways in which you're getting an uh, improvement under MIPS. And then finally, the cost of what you're doing, because they're tracking the cost around what you're doing, which is replacing the old value-based modifier. So these are the four elements within MIPS that help determine your payback and uh, uh, your reimbursement under the CMS structure. Okay, so quality, you have to report six quality metrics, including an outcome for a minimum of three months. And if you end up in private practice, you do this through your office, you can report a group of 15 quality metrics for a year for a group, or you can report six individual for a minimum of three months. And there are a bunch of different ways to do this. I'm sure it works very efficiently since it's a governmental website. I don't have to do that personally. We do that uh, from an institutional level. Um, and uh, again, a lot of the quality metrics are the things that we've already talked about. There are all these basic quality metrics around sinusitis, around AOE, around uh, acute otitis media, uh, around otitis media with effusion, the basic ones, and what they're looking for. So for example, you can see that otitis externa is listed not just for us, but under emergency medicine and pediatrics. Um, I don't know why they don't have a family medicine category for that. But the primary steward, again, here is American Academy of Otolaryngology, because they know that this is the one, that we're the ones who are setting the tone and determining what's appropriate quality care and evidence-based practice for this. Um, similarly, the punishment, making sure that they were not prescribed systemic antibiotic therapy. In other words, making sure that you use topical medication instead of using systemic antibiotics. So these are the types of quality metrics that you will see in reporting quality around MIPS. Um, improvement activities. You have to attest that you completed four improvement activities for a minimum of 90 days. If you're in a patient-centered medical home, that's going to qualify right off the bat, okay? Most of you will not be. You know, I, I didn't get into patient center or primary center care medical homes. Um, I don't want to get into the details around that. It's relatively confusing and doesn't really involve us as much. Um, tobacco use. So these are the improvement strategies, right? So you can report tobacco use. This is why now all of you have to click a little box on patients, which is awesome in pediatric laryngology, saying my 12-year-old patient hasn't started smoking yet, which is terrific, and I've counseled them not to. Um, but that you're screening, asking if they're using uh, tobacco and intervening, trying to get them to quit. Advancing care, okay, uh, a big part of this is making sure that you send a summary of care. So most of you who are on EMRs, when your patients check out, they get a little summary of their care visit. It has a few diagnoses listed. It has their medications listed. For example, if you're an EPIC, we're on all scripts, so it's just a bunch of garbled nonsense. It looks like a ransom note. But in EPIC, you will get, you know, a, uh, a list of the medications you're being discharged with your next follow-up appointment and any upcoming appointments that you have. That's a summary of care. E-prescribing, that's advancing care information. This is all the stuff that used to be under meaningful use. Um, providing patient access, that's the patient portal. So if your patient has a way to contact your office through the electronic medical record, all of these count towards the advancing care information aspect of this. 
Okay, so here's how this all adds up together. So the quality metrics represent 60% of the uh, determination of your score for MIPS. Improvement activities are 15% and advancing care information is 25%. You will notice that cost was not a part of it when they first started this because there was too much variability around cost. I'll be honest, I don't know what the cost component is. I think it's less than 10% right now. Um, yeah, I think it's less than 10%, I'll have to double check, but it has not been a big part of that because there's too much variability in the way cost is determined depending on what type of healthcare environment you work in. But quality improvement and advancing care are the three critical parts of that. And again, as I mentioned, this is very much a zero sum game still. So you can either go up or you can go down, but there is a neutrality involved around this because non-reporters are given very bad scores and are gonna get punished. Whereas if you're reporting, you can actually get an improvement of that. And the highest performers can actually get an additional 10%, but it's gonna all equal out. So any sort of improvements, in payment is going to balance out with any penalties so that it's a zero-sum game. It's flat all the way around. So effectively, may the odds be ever in your favor, this is the Hunger Games for medical practices in many ways. Okay, and then finally, as time goes on, I guess cost is eventually going to be 15%. They haven't actually gotten to that number, but it's going to split between quality, cost, improvement, and advancing care. So this is the idea. These are the four elements behind MIPS that will help determine your payout going forward. Um, and then I'll wrap up with this incredibly confusing slide. When you get involved with a lot of governmental regulations and governmental organizations, this is where things get really confusing because you get slides like this. So let me stop on quality. And we're gonna to turn to safety for the next few minutes. But before I do that, I give a lot of talks to pediatrics departments and family medicine and things like that. And they always ask me to put in a few slides on life lessons they can learn as residents. So I actually just copied one of those over real quick. I know all of you guys have had great training in otolaryngology. Every program you're at has terrific training in otolaryngology, but they don't teach you some important life skills. These are the things I wish I had learned in residency training. I wish I had learned about financial services, okay? What do you need to know about financial services? There are really only a few things you need to know, but you are gonna get bombarded with people who see a giant target painted on your forehead because you're gonna have a six-figure salary and absolutely no idea what to do with it. So a lot of people are gonna to try to take advantage of it. Make sure that you ask a lot of questions. The first one is, are you a fiduciary? Okay. Why does that matter to you? Because fiduciaries have a legal obligation to keep your financial best interests in mind, not their own. So they have to do things that promote your well-being instead of yours. How do you choose a financial advisor? There are a lot of different ways to do that. I'm not going to get into it now, except to tell you this. What's the first question you should ask? Very simple. Anybody who comes to you selling insurance, financial advice, anything like that, ask them one question. How do you make money? How do they get paid? How should they get paid? What you want is somebody whose incentives align with yours. You never want to be with somebody who gets paid to sell you stuff, getting paid on commissions for things. You want somebody who gets paid when you get paid, meaning they take a percentage of your portfolio on an annual basis. So for example, if your financial portfolio goes up and you made a bunch of money in one year, they get paid more. Okay, so most financial advisors and most fiduciaries take 1% of your portfolio as their payment every year, okay? That's pretty standard fee. Anything more than that and you're paying too much. But a standard 1% is usually the way that uh, you'll wanna go. Okay, and then finally some unsolicited life advice. What is free advice worth? Exactly what you paid for it. Most importantly, remember, if you are not paying for a service, you are not the consumer, you are the commodity being traded. So all of you using Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, many of you are going to be applying for jobs. Your employers will be looking at these things to see how you present yourself publicly. Remember that you are the commodity here. You are not actually the consumer. Free services are selling your data and they're selling information about you. So just keep that in mind as you go forward with these things. Okay, let's talk about safety. So healthcare, is it hazardous? Yeah, it's considered to be extremely dangerous. It's somewhere in the category along with mountain climbing and bungee jumping, whereas airline travel is incredibly safe that we know of, right? Our annual death rates in the United States, depending on how you actually evaluate that data, suggest that we have very few on average commercial aviation deaths, but lots and lots of deaths associated with medical error. Again, this number coming from that Institute of Medicine um, number. 
Pediatric ENT, as the one example I know well, is generally quite safe. We talked about all those major outcome problems um, that NISQIP is looking at, but if you look at the data around this, you'll see these major outcome issues, DVT, CLABSIS, sepsis, are really quite rare with the exception of tracheostomy because the patients who require tracheostomy for the most part are very, very sick outside of the isolated subglottic stenosis. Those are patients who tend to be very, very sick from long-term mechanical ventilation. So pediatric ENT is generally very safe with the exception that we know that there's probably some room for improvement around tracheostomy standardization and airway reconstruction. Again, this comes from Emily Boss and Rahul Shah's paper on the subject. Okay, so uh, when they looked at this data, uh, let's see here. Here's the important part. The overall rate of postoperative morbidity in pediatric laryngology is low, but there's definitely room for quality improvement, including trach, airway reconstruction, some ear surgery, and uh, abscess drainage. And we need to start finding outcomes that are specific to laryngology procedures, because a lot of the things like CLABC and DVT and cardiac arrest are not really relevant to what we do in otolaryngology. Okay, but safety is a big issue in healthcare, right? This is the case that's always cited. So there was a child who was identified as possible congenital syphilis, was supposed to get 150,000 units of benzathione penicillin, and instead was given 1.5 million units. So he was given 10 times the amount he was supposed to be given. And they found over 30 system errors when they looked at this process. Starting with this, this is how the prescription was written, handwritten in the chart. Uh, kind of difficult. Now, obviously, knowing that it was supposed to be uh, benzothiene penicillin G for 150,000 units IM times one, it's easy to read that knowing that as background. But imagine if you were reading this for the first time, having no idea who wrote it or what they were trying to construe, you can see where this would be a problem. At the same time, look at what's written on the pen with the penicillin. It's very difficult to actually see the number of units that are being delivered here. Okay. One of the concepts I want to introduce you to is the Swiss cheese model of medical error. It is almost impossible to commit medical error in a vacuum. It almost never actually revolves around one person or one incident. It's a Swiss cheese model in that all the holes have to line up for something to go all the way to a major error outcome. So in this system, for example, in the Denver case, it was a bunch of stuff. It lined up that all of these different things kind of went wrong. They had an, an ambiguous drug order. There was no maximum dose warning in the medical uh, drug information system. The IM warning wasn't written visibly. There was a problem with staffing. All these problems lined up and all the holes lined up for an error to escape through. So when you are looking at safety in your own practices, remember, it is not revolving around any one person. Everybody has a role in developing safety because safety is a process that requires multiple uh, different people and multiple different systems involved. Okay, so we said, well, obviously this can't happen in modern healthcare because we have checklists, right? So we have checklists in the OR, we have checklists for anesthesia, we have checklists for everything we do because that's what the airlines do, so that must make us safer. We have checklists in my OR, I help develop it. Checklists work great until they don't, right? Because our checklist was sitting off the wall, just not even taped up, and nobody was reading it. So checklists don't work if you don't actually read them and don't actually utilize them. But that's okay, right? Because we have EMRs and EMRs prevent medical errors too, until you start looking more carefully into EMRs and realizing that a single typo can take somebody to 411 kilos in a pediatric patient. Well, that's obviously not gonna work. Um, so medical errors, again, can occur when your EMR is failing. And then there are just simple errors of human factors. So for example, uh, I walked into the OR one day and found this situation under the hand sanitizer. That's a bottle of heparin with a needle and syringe sticking out of it that had been left there by somebody the previous day and never got cleaned up. Well, that doesn't seem very safe to me. One of my favorite examples of safety errors came from this. All of you guys have used lidocaine. Now, normally when I give this talk, I gave this to the ASPO fellows last year. I asked them, what is this? This is plain lidocaine, right? It's lidocaine 1% and 10 milligrams per ml, and there's no epinephrine in it. And you know that because it's green. And the reason you know that is because lidocaine with epi is red. And that has lidocaine 1%, same thing, 10 milligrams per ml, but it's got epinephrine at 1 to 100,000 in red. So the bright red lettering helps you differentiate it from the green, right? Makes sense until it doesn't. This is the new labeling 
on lidocaine with epinephrine. It's green and red. It's now a Christmas tree, and it's got the little red letters that say epi, but it still has the green that says lidocaine. And if you're used to seeing green plain lidocaine or red for lidocaine with epi, this can get very confusing. So you got to be on the lookout because people are changing things constantly, and it really does interfere with your ability to provide safe care when these things are changing constantly. And these two are, in fact, the same medication. They have the same stock number. They're exactly the same, but they're labeled differently. So that poses a problem in the safety arena. So how did I get into safety? Just a real quick pitch on what my research was around. Um, people who get into safety typically either have one of two things happen for them. They either had a bad experience, like somebody got lit on fire, or they're just a little bit of a sociopath. I'm kind of considered the world's expert in operating room fires. Not something I necessarily want to get famous for, but I run the Joint Commission's Committee on Operating Room Fires, and I ran the FDA subcommittee on this for a number of years. And it all stemmed from, uh, I was about two years out of fellowship, maybe three years, and one of my superstar residents, who many of you know, he's a prominent pediatric laryngologist now, um, we were doing an endoscopic airway case, and somebody left the light on and put the cable down on the drape, and within moments, it burned a hole right through the drape, and that drape just melted away, and the patient would have gotten severely burned, except we'd already moved him onto a stretcher and we're rolling out of the room. But this scared the crap out of me, and so I started investigating it. So as you go forward in your careers and you say, well, is this really meaningful to me? You can actually turn your entire career based on one incident around this. I started studying operating room fires and operating room burns just from this one single incident. And now all my research, let's see if this video will play, revolves around operating room fire. So here's a model of tonsillectomy. I'm doing a bovi tonsillectomy in an opera in an uh, in an oxygen enriched environment and can create a fire from that. Yeah, this is what we got famous for was this chicken model. So you can develop a pretty strong safety program at your organization. I do a lot of simulation of airway fires. This was uh, regarding a legal case uh, where somebody was doing a laser airway surgery. And just watch what happens here because I think that I've got the fire put out. I do everything right, pull the tube out. Right, this is what they ask you on the boards. What do you do if you have a fire? You pull out the tube, pour water down the airway, and then go pay attention to reestablishing ventilation for the patient. But I don't see what's actually happening, which is all this residual oxygen in my lungs is still catching on fire. So that's kind of how I got interested in the safety aspect of otolaryngology because we do certain things like laser airway surgery that are very high risk procedures. But in your organizations, as I mentioned, you all have the opportunity to do safety work and it's considered one of the essential parts of uh, residency education. So I mentioned to you that trachs are one of the opportunities, one of the places that we have for improvement. And I know we're running out of time, so I'm gonna go quickly through this. So I call this our tracheostomy standardization from a train wreck to a slightly slower train wreck. You guys ever watched this program, This Is Us? It's absolutely terrible. I actually broke up with a woman just because she made me watch one episode of this. It's awful. But I use this as a parallel because while this people talk about this is us, this is us. This is my healthcare system, Children's Memorial Hermann Hospital, part of Memorial Hermann Healthcare System at the Texas Medical Center here. It's a huge medical center. Um, we're a huge quaternary care children's hospital. We're one of four level four NICU services, and we're a level one pediatric trauma center, uh, the first one in this area. We have 118 level four NICU beds. So we've got a baby factory and a 32, uh, that's an old slide, that number is now 48 bed PICU with a busy cardiac surgery program. Um, when I first started here, we had two pediatric laryngologists and five pediatric surgeons. We're now four pediatric laryngologists and eight pediatric surgeons. But as we added more faculty, we increased our variability in our practice patterns. So we went back and retrospectively reviewed our tracheostomy performance. And the good idea for all of you is, if you're looking for a quality improvement project, if you're interested in finding a safety improvement project, good way to do it, you can't really ever understand it until you start studying what you've done. So go back and study what you've actually accomplished uh, or study what you've actually done so that you can actually understand where you need to improve. So otolaryngology did about 91% of the traits in that time. Those first few years, we had five accidental decannulations. We had one code and two had to go back to the OR for replacement. We had a litany of horror stories as a result. Thankfully, no deaths or anoxic brain injuries. But when we started looking into the details of it, we found that three were considered 
totally unexplained decannulations. Apparently self-decannulated while not being watched. Um, one decannulation was because the nurse decided to bathe the kid. So picked him up while he was attached to the ventilator, moved the kid, and the ventilator pulled the trach out. One was a decannulation by an unsupervised resident during a trach change, which we were unable to replace. We had some wound breakdowns and a lot of variability. So every time a trach would end up in the ICU, depending on who did the operation, they'd have a totally different set of post-operative management things around that. We had no standardization around pre-op management, post-op management, sedation, trach changes, family teaching. We were wasting resources. We were frustrating physicians. We were frustrating family. We were really frustrating the staff. So we decided to just standardize our workflow. And we said, let's make sure we standardize who we're selecting. How are we going to manage things post-op? How do we do our discharge planning? Now, how do you standardize a process? Well, first, you've got to get buy-in from all the stakeholders, right? Not hard to do when you're wasting a lot of resources and everybody's frustrated. Everybody's going to be happy to jump in on the process. Then you've got to get all your stakeholders together. So that's not just surgeons, but it's ICU, it's families, it's respiratory, social work, even the hospital administrators. And as I mentioned to you, if you don't know what you're trying to improve, you've got to start looking at it. You've got to actually study it first before you can start uh, actually trying to affect change. And then most importantly, once you affect change, make sure you track your results so you can see what you're doing. So we got everybody together and we actually came up with a trait protocol. It's about a three page document, looking at preoperative assessment, doing all of our post-operative care and how we're gonna manage that. And how do we handle it? For example, when the patient comes to the bed, there's gonna be a sign on their bed. What are we gonna do when they come in? How is suctioning? How are dressings? How is sedation being done? How are collars and ties being handled? Okay. And we put it together on a worksheet. And this worksheet goes in front of every patient. And you can just circle what are all the things going on here with this patient. What type of tube do they have? Do they have stay sutures? Here's what we're doing from respiratory support. Here's what we're doing from a sedation standpoint. So everybody understands what's being done from there. And then we have this whole sheet on post-op management. So it takes a long time and a lot of iterations. But if you start studying what you need to change, then you can figure out how to change it. So I won't go through the details here. But if the parameters that we are studying with this sound familiar to you, well, yeah, look at what we've decided in our protocols, which is to look at what's the indication? How are we doing the dressings? Are we using sutures? Are we using paralytics? Well, guess what? Those actually come straight from this book. So the same things that the ACS is using to assess us on quality metrics are the same parameters that we decided to study in our own uh, in our in our own uh, institution because we knew that we wanted them to match the NISQIT parameters. So protocols, what are the what are the problems with doing these things? They take forever, right? You tend to get mission creep and you get the ever expanding wasteland of stakeholders. It took us almost two and a half years just to get approval. We've all implemented these protocols, but despite the fact that the last time I visited this was over a year and a half ago, this actual protocol adoption hasn't actually gotten approved yet because there's actually a committee on protocols um, that had to first be developed by the Committee on Committees, true story, and they had to develop a policy around policies. Yeah, that's, that's all true. So we haven't actually gotten this as part of our system policy yet, but everybody's actually executing on it. Um, and then you put it into your EMR. So once you've done that, you can put it directly into your EMR so that all of these care issues are put directly into your EMR so that they automatically come up as part of your trach platform. And then where do you go? Well, we don't have an evidence base around some of these things, so we're starting to look at it. So uh, actually, we just, where did we get this accepted? I think at ESPO, which just got canceled, we did a study looking at early versus late trach change in children, whether you could do a trach change on day three or whether you should wait to day five or day seven. We have found no difference, so we've decided to go to earlier trach change um, just to try to expedite patient care. Um, and then we are making sure that all, everything we're tracking, as I mentioned, follows NISQIP so that we can report our NISQIP data the same way we're tracking our internal data. So it's not as miserable as you'd think, getting a whole bunch of people together and thinking along the same lines. It's easy to get buy-in from people who are engaged about the outcome, but it's a slow process and it can be a little bit tedious. Make sure you track your outcomes. So let me conclude right on the dot. Safety and quality care is the next logical step in healthcare and otolaryngology. ENT in general provides safe care and doesn't have a ton of serious morbidity about it, but we need to start thinking about appropriate use. Are we doing appropriate things in terms of imaging, in terms of antibiotics? How are we not overutilizing it? 
Think about tonsillectomy. We were probably over-utilizing it until the clinical practice guidelines came out. Same thing with tympanostomy tubes. Those new clinical practice guidelines have decreased tympanostomy tube placement utilization. And so we need to make sure that we're not over-utilizing care. We want to make sure we're adhering to these evidence-based best practice clinical guidelines. And while I'm, unfortunately, I realize this is not as interesting as a clinical topic, unfortunately, a lot of our jobs are going to depend around delivering quality care in the future going forward. So what can you do? Well, you don't get to opt out, okay? It's not really an option to opt out. If you're going to be involved in healthcare, you're going to be involved. Expect a bait and switch, okay? As all things involved with the government, they'll sell you one thing and then they're going to end up delivering something else. There are going to be differences depending on your practice. We know that IT is changing around every year, and so that's going to change how we do things. There's got to be good clinical integration, but expect that this is a moving target. Things are always going to be changing in terms of the way we do things. I will end with this note from The Simpsons. Great. I will shoot myself for bringing this up. And if you ever come down to Houston, come hang out with me. I play in a 90s cover band. You're always welcome to come hang out with us down there. So I will stop there a few minutes over time. I apologize and take any questions. I hope this is helpful or meaningful for you. Or Dr. Comer might be the only person still there. Dr. Roy, thank you so much for this lecture. Dr. Comer actually had to go to the OR, so he was sad to have to leave. But I'm glad somebody's taking care of sick people. Right? We are very um, thankful that you came and spoke today. Thank well, I appreciate it. Thank you. Something in the chat box. Oh. Well, thank you, Dr. Bowers, I'm assuming. Thank you very much. It means a lot to me. I do appreciate it. Dr. Bowers said, great lecture. Thank you. I, I just realized you sent it to the panelists. Thank you very much. Anybody have any other questions? Thank you, Dr. Bird, who also enjoyed the talk. I really do appreciate that. So anybody have any, any, I'm always happy to take compliments, but if anybody has any questions or things they'd like to discuss, I'm happy to discuss them as well. Remember, you guys watching this, you are the future of our field. I'm a mid-career guy, and I literally mean I am at the very apex of my career. I am a uh, I'm 49 years old and I'm 17 years out of fellowship. And so I've got basically 17 years left till I'm done practicing, I think. So this is the halfway point of my career. You guys are the future of what happens to the specialty and what happens to healthcare. So I wanna make sure that I can provide you with information that is helpful for you and, uh, and try to give you some guidance if I can. Cause I need you guys to take care of me. I'm getting sick as I get old. Aging sucks by the way. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. I'll give it one more second, Sarah Lynn, if you don't mind, just in case somebody's typing something. But I see the number of attendees dropping off slowly, so. Well, thank you again. We did record it, so it'll be up on our website and our YouTube channel. And oh, dear God, really? <laughs> if that's okay with you, of course. Oh my God, I'm not sure anybody <laughs> deserves to have that inflicted on them. <laughs> I was going to say, I recommend everybody watch it. It's great. Thanks. I appreciate it. Okay. All right. Well, guys, stay safe, stay healthy out there, and thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for a great week. We'll start back again on Monday.